So hello everyone and uh, good afternoon and uh, I welcome you all to our page the Royal Doc Line and as you know this is actually the telehealth medicine where uh, we have planned to give you the consultations online from the comfort of your home. You can ask the questions, you can book an appointment and uh, we can do a lot of the thing. So I have decided uh, today to talk about the different things uh, which are uh, which are pertaining to certain women conditions. Before that, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Yasmin Haseeb and uh, I'm working in OBGYN for the last 30 years. For the whole of my life, I have dedicated myself for the Safe Motherhood Initiative because I saw many deaths of the women and even uh, still in the developing countries, specifically in the Asian countries, every 20 minutes one mother is dying anywhere so i have uh, seen lot of the complications related with the woman health specifically the high blood pressure and uh, sepsis sepsis is actually the infection of the woman after the delivery or even during the pregnancy and uh, also uh, the diabetes and hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is the bleeding specifically during the pregnancy and more commonly after the birth of baby, which is called postpartum hemorrhage. So these are the main uh, motives which gave me a, a hint to work for the Safe Motherhood Initiative. And uh, secondly, throughout my career, I have seen the woman is suffering since she starts her period. Uh, in the beginning, when she is a teenager, she is having either uh, skipping of the period or she is having a uh, lot of the bleeding, passing the clots, going into the anemia. And sometimes we see the patients, younger people, like 15, 16, 14, they are coming and with the hemoglobin, which is three, four, and they're getting admitted in the intensive care units for the blood transfusion. And then we see the women in the reproductive age group where they are coming for the contraception, they are coming with the fibroids of the uterus, they are coming with irregular periods, with the painful periods. This is usually I saw in the reproductive age group. And then I am also having the patients uh, in the older age group just before uh, the stopping their periods uh, that is called as a perimenopausal age group in which they are suffering either with the tumors which are the fibroids or sometimes cancer cancers of the neck of the uterus which is called a cervix and uh, sometimes the people also come with the irregular bleeding because of hormonal imbalances and then the people are also suffering with some other problem like the high blood pressures leukemias anemias diabetes and they are also having the problems with the bleeding and uh, they are suffering with all these problems and then once they start uh, their uh, periods then again the woman may sometimes come with uh, the postmenopausal bleeding and recently i have seen two three patients in uh, three patients in one week with the cancer of the uh, uterine wall which is called as an endometrium so all of these things they gave me an idea that uh, why not to create awareness among the women so my IT team, I'm so grateful to everybody. They just searched through, I myself searched through uh, the search engines and we came to know that in the younger age group specifically, uh, the people are worried and they are searching about the polycystic ovaries. In my clinic, in my day-to-day -day practice, what I see in my clinic, if I see 35 patients, out of them, five to seven patients, they are coming with the polycystic ovaries. And most of the time, they are younger people. And secondly, the people who are with the, the infertility, they are not able to procreate or they are not able to produce children. So these are the two categories which I am receiving in my day-to-day -day practice. So that's why I decided to include the polycystic ovaries or the PCO in my today's lecture and today's webinar. And uh, after this, we will also see about the fibroids uterus or the tumor of the uterus. And then followed by, we will also see the painful period or the dysmenorrhea. And then we will also go through the irregular bleeding. And uh, after getting the feedback from you people, if you would like to have a few more lectures about the uh, things about the topics uh, which are bothering you, we can also do a few more semi, uh, such webinars. So we will start with the polycystic ovaries today and many people, they are familiarized with this condition. So let's move on to our first slide. And what is a polycystic ovaries? In women, you all know that there is a uterus and there are two ovaries. As you can see over here, I have made this picture. This is actually the uterus. This is the vagina. These are the two tubes and this is the ovaries. Actually, all all the things they are being done with the ovaries and uterus has got only two functions either it brings period or it it makes the baby and then at a time it uh, 
pushes the baby outside in the world. So these are the two functions. And the uterus is always under the effect of the ovaries. So Isa, just give me a, a hand that everything is going very well before we switch over to the further slides. Yes, everything Great. is good. Very good. So if you people are feeling any trouble or you want to put some questions, kindly put that in the chat and uh, they will be answered in our question answer session. However, I got few responses and I will include them in my uh, these uh, sessions and in the slides as well. And if still there are a few questions you can always put in the chat. You are welcome about it. So we were talking about the uterus and the ovaries, and this is the normal structure of the female genital tract. This is the normal ovary. Every month, 10 to 12 eggs, they mature and only one of them, which is a bigger one, it ruptures. It brings the eggs outside and then a carpus luteum is formed. This is the normal function of the ovary. ovary. What happens in the polycystic ovaries? It means that the ovary has got a multiple cyst. You can see that these are multiple cysts. And as a result of which the name was given as a polycystic ovaries. And you can see there is no egg we are releasing over here as compared to the egg which is being released over here. And it affects the woman in usually the reproductive age group, in the teenager group, even the people who just started their period, they are coming here, they are saying the mothers are worried. My uh, daughter is not having a monthly period and it is usually characterized by the irregular menstrual cycles and there is a more and more androgen or the male type of the hormone as a result of which the people are having loss of hair or they are having the facial hair growth and androgen hormone is also responsible for causing the weight gain and the obesity to the woman. So PCOS can lead to various symptoms, how the people come with it. Either they come with the irregular bleeding or they come with the weight gain, with uh, the um, skipping of the periods. And this is not only the thing. We are concerned with the longer term effects and the complications as well. And these longer term effects are related with the development of the diabetes and the heart disease, as well as if the woman, she becomes pregnant, there are more chances to have the abortions. So that's why we are more concerned with it. And uh, so this is the introduction and how common it is. About 5 to 10 percent of the women worldwide, this is a worldwide incidence. It is one of the most commonest endocrine disorders among the women of the reproductive age. Despite its prevalence, PCO often goes undiagnosed or misdiagnosed due to a lack of awareness. Actually, most of the time, uh, the diagnosis is just done by looking at the ultrasound. So this is very important point which I want to highlight. Sometimes you go and uh, the ultrasound is done and the woman is told that you are having the polycystic ovaries or the PCO. And then she started worrying because she knows that her friend or someone in the family, she is undergoing a problem with the infertility, with skipping of the period. And now the dilemma starts. The woman comes to the clinic and once we ask them that what about your period, she tells us that my period is regular. So she is not a polycystic ovaries. Polycystic ovaries for the diagnosis has to have certain criteria that she must have something clinically or the symptoms like irregular bleeding or irregular periods or skipping of the periods. These are the different patterns or she must have the weight gain or she must have the ultrasound finding and some of the hormonal tests. Then on the base of that, then we label somebody as a polycystic ovaries. So if somebody tells you with the regular periods on the ultrasound that you have a PCO, so don't worry about it. And secondly, I would highlight because that PCO is is not your fault. It is like sort of the disease which can anybody can develop. So this is none of your fault. Please uh, just uh, keep it in your mind, right? How the people come? They come like irregular periods, acne, hair growth on the face or the body. This is called as hirsutism and the weight gain. Women with PCOS may also experience the infertility, mood swings, and fatigue because they are under the uh, always thinking about the younger woman specifically. Oh, maybe I may not be able to bring a baby. This is the main thing which the woman and the mother and the family is asking us. So these all things develop because of the effect of excessive androgens because estrogen is actually the hormone which is a normal female hormone. But in the PCOS patients, the androgens which are the male hormone, they are coming and they are converting themselves into the estrogen and 
hence it is causing the acne and mood swings and the fatigues and the weight gain. So this is actually the underlying thing. So early detection and the treatment is actually the backbone of preventing the complications. How you diagnose? On the as I told you that the diagnosis is not only on the ultrasound. So be sure if you are being told you are having a PCOS, no, you are not as a PCOS. Always go to your doctor and discuss it properly. As long as you, you don't have any symptoms and your body, body weight is okay, just having the ultrasound findings is not a PCO. So this is a good news that just having the ultrasound finding is not a PCO because in the ovary, the normal activity of the follicles are also going on. And sometimes these follicles are picked up during the ultrasound examination. And then they tell the woman that you are having the PCO. So for the proper evaluation, you must always go to your doctor and discuss your worries and the thing. What is the treatment? This is the most important part. The treatment of the PCOS is aimed what? We want to manage your symptoms. What are those? That the people are skipping the period. We want to regulate the period. People are having the androgen excess in the body as a result of the weight, weight, weight gain. So reduction of the weight gain and also the acne, hair fall, and the woman who is suffering suffering with infertility or not able to bring a baby. So we want to address those symptoms. And at the same time, we have to address the underlying hormonal imbalances which are ongoing. So this is the key element. This is our aim. And secondly, how can we achieve that? Yes, we can achieve that. And I have seen many people who have achieved it, but you have to be committed. What are these things? The first line of the treatment is the lifestyle modification, such as a healthy diet and a regular exercise. As we are all in an era where we, have, we are having a sedentary lifestyle, this is one of the factor that it is causing the problems in the weight gain and hence bringing the uh, problems to the health. So it can help improve the symptoms and help reduce the risk of complications in the longer term. Then the other part is the medications. What medications are to be given? These are the birth control pills, metformins and anti androgen medications. So over here, I would like to highlight that the birth control pills, when I talk to the woman, and her mother is concerned that, oh, you will give the oral contraceptive pill to my uh, child. Please, we have to give it just to regulate your period. And the birth control pills will not affect your health in the longer term, as long as you are fit to use the birth control pills. Birth control pills are the pills which are not only used as a contraceptive measures. There are other benefits of the birth control pills. So this is the important thing you have to understand if your doctor prescribes you are fit to use that there is no problem in using it so yeah you can use that there is no problem in it because we are using it with some other purpose not as a birth control and i always tell the mom don't tell the other people that your child is using the birth control pill because they're worried oh this is used as a birth control so better just to keep it as a confidential and the people who want to regulate their period, they can use the birth control pill for a while. But I would highlight that the lifestyle modification should be the first line. Then the second one is a metformin. Metformin is, as you many people uh, are familiarized, this medicine is coming with the name of glucophage. And uh, this medication is being used for the diabetes. Yes, absolutely right. This is an anti-diabetic medication. However, it is also utilized for the control of the fat and it reduces the fat and it can be used for this purpose. So if you are using the metformin and somebody is asking, oh, you are using it anti-diabetic medication. So just kindly don't be upset. You can very politely tell them that metformin has got many other effects. So that's why it is being used. What I do usually, I stress upon the lifestyle modification. If it is not helping, then I add the metformin. And if metformin is not controlling, then I add the butt control pills. Otherwise, I withhold my hands to give the birth control pills to the younger people because they are always worried when you give them the birth control pills. And then entry androgens, which are in many people, you are familiarized with the Dian 35. This is the most commonest medication which the people are using. And I have seen many dermatologists and all the beauty saloons, they are just prescribing them for the acne. So please don't take it until unless it has been prescribed to you by your doctor, because all of these medications, they can bring lots of of the complications as well at the same time they can bring the clots in the legs or in the in the chest or in the lungs and it there can be high risk they can affect the liver 
So you have to be careful. Don't use them just by the prescription of someone who is not a healthcare professional. So you have to go to the healthcare professional, your doctor, and then you can discuss and you can check it if uh, you both agree for the use. So these are all the things which can be utilized for this purpose. And uh, then there are the people who are worried about the infertility. So we see the two categories of the patient. One, the young patient or even the married people, they are concerned to regulate the period. So this is one group of the people. The second group of the people, they are coming for the infertility, that they are not able to produce a child. As you have seen in the slides, that the actual problem is not to produce the egg. If there is no egg, the woman is not able to produce a child. So that's why this is a second category where they are coming for the problem of fertility. This is one of the commonest cause of the infertility in the woman. So in this uh, category, again, the treatment options are the same. The lifestyle modification, metformin. We also add inositol. What is inositol? Inositol is actually a multivitamin and it has got the multiple functions. This question I have also received. So I will address this inositol. Thus, inositol is a sort of the multivitamin which helps in the regulation of the weight as well as it helps in the regulation of certain hormones and the chemicals in the body. So the question was, can we use it with the birth control? Yes, you can use it. There is no harm in it. However, in the research, it has been seen that it should not be used for a longer period of the time. So what you can do is you can use for three, four months. That can, then you can take a break and then you can use it again. So this is another way. Or if still uh, you uh, have any concern, you can ask about it with your healthcare professional. However, I would say that inositol is not a, uh, is not a medication which can harm you if you use it with the fertility medications or if you use it with the oral contraceptive pills. So this is a sort of the multivitamin. I think the question has been answered. And then in the fertility, along with these options, uh, of course, she wants the children. So oral contraceptive pills are not for her. So what else? So we have to address her concern along with her multivitamins and along with her metformin. We can add the ovulation induction medications, which can bring the X. So these medications are to be utilized and they are given by the doctors. Or if still there is a problem or there is some another issue in the conception we can go with the test tube babies but it is not for all the people it has to have the proper evaluation i think the things are clear now i would address the long-term side effects and long-term health risks which are with the polycystic ovaries what it can be women with the pcos they are at increased risk of developing the type 2 diabetes high blood pressure and the heart disease so these are the long-term side effects and the long-term health risk which can develop because of the pcos so we have to work together we have to work as a team in order to uh, get rid of the polycystic ovaries managing the pcos through the lifestyle changes and the medications can help reduce the risk of the long-term health complications so this is a Good thing. Yes, you can do it. Regular monitoring and the screening for the related conditions are essential for the woman with polycystic ovaries. As you can see that these are the polycystic ovaries. What it will do? It will do the hyperandrogens. Hyperandrogens are the increase in the amount of the hormones. It will cause the acne, increase hair growth, as well as the insulin resistance and then infertility and then the acne and the depression. Depression because the woman is thinking that why she is not getting period and what is going on. And secondly, she is also afraid that whether she will be able to produce a child or not. I have seen lots of the people who have conceived and their periods have been regular, the lifestyle modifications and only the metformin. So this is about the long-term health risks, the psychological impact. As I told you, the people are worried because of their look, because of loss of the self-esteem, emotional disturbances, and uh, they are thinking that what is going on with them. Rather than talking to the people who are non-medical, you should always go to your healthcare provider and seek for help from them and stay positive because this is none of your fault. But However, if it comes, you can do and combat this condition. I have seen lots of the people who are committed and they are having a normal period just by losing the weight, by walk, by exercise, by yoga, and just little bit medications. So if those people can do it, you can also do it. So the second thing which I have uh, seen about the polycystic ovaries, our population, our public, they need a lot of awareness about it. Increasing the public awareness about the PCOS is very crucial to ensure 
the early detection and the proper management of this condition. So educational campaigns such as this webinar, community events, and online resources can help raise the awareness about the PCOS and its impact on the women's health. Rather, I'm trying to uh, write some patient information leaflet just to give you an idea that how you can cover up and how you can fight with the polycystic ovaries and i'm tr i'm trying to write it in the english but however we will also make it available in the urdu as well and as i'm working in the gulf so i'm also planning to make a translation in arabic as well so the process is ongoing and uh, once it is done we will share with the people advocacy effects to improve the access to the healthcare and the support for the women with the pcos are also important in promoting the awareness and understanding of the condition this is very important so in conclusion, polycystic ovarian syndrome is a common hormonal disorder which can affect many women worldwide. By increasing the public awareness, early detection, and the proper management, the women can lead a healthy lifestyle, a healthy lives, and reduce the risk of the long-term complication. It is important for the individuals to educate themselves about the PCOS and support efforts to promote the awareness and understanding of this prevalent condition. I hope so uh, that uh, this thing has helped you and if you still have your questions, we can go through them. So in the end, I would say that PCOS is not a condition which you cannot fight with. You can because you are brave and you can do it. And this webinar is a part of that, that uh, I want to aware this. I want to create the awareness among the people so that they can uh, enjoy their life as with the other people. So don't be worried about it. You can do it. I know that. I have seen lots of the people. And please remember, having a PCO is none of your fault. Please remember it, right? So this is none of your fault. So Isa, is there anything else the people uh, want to ask? In the meanwhile, we will switch over to our next uh, slides and the next uh, lecture, which is about uh, the fibroid uterus. So, Isa, just give me the hint that everything is going very well. Uh, yes, everything is good. There are a couple of questions about PCOS, but would you like to answer them now or after the? I think we can keep it in the question answer session so okay. that they can be properly done. Okay. Yeah. We can move on then. Yeah. Please keep on posting your questions as much as you want. We are here to answer everything. Slide share. Yeah. So is that just give me a hint? You can see my slides. Yes, I can. That's great. So. Uh, uh, next uh, lecture is about the fibroid uterus. Many people, they are aware about this name fibroid. Or sometimes the people talk about leomyoma or sometimes they call tumors. So first of all, I would like to say that uh, relax. This is not a big deal. And the good thing about the fibroids is 99.99% .99 of them, they are benign. Benign means they are not cancerous. They do not bring cancer. Having a change of the cancer is very, very rare in the fibroids, and this happens in a very old age group. So this is a good thing about the fibroid. Rather than having the endometrial cancer, having the fibroid is much better as compared to having the endometrial cancer. So fibroid uterus, I have seen even in the younger age group, which are about 15, 16 years of the age group, in the middle age group, in the reproductive age group, in the older age group and after even after stopping the period in the woman but the management is always different in the different age group so if you get the fibroid don't be upset about it we have to see lots of the things before we make a plan for the fibroid treatment so let's uh, go deeper into the fibroid to give you an idea that what the fibroid is so Fibroids are actually, you can see this picture with me, just as we saw the picture, this picture will always be coming in all the lectures. So I always remember that this is the uterus. As you can see, these are over tubes through which the baby forms. And this one, these are the two ovaries. 
First, we saw the problem in the ovaries that was about the polycystic ovaries. Now we are coming back into the uterus. So in the woman, the problem can arise in the uterus, in the tubes, or in the, in the ovaries. So now we are going some problem in the uterus. As you can see, this whitish and off-white color uh, things, these are the fibroids. These are actually the tumors. And you can see that they can be very small, they can be a little bit larger, or they can be very large, right? or they can sometimes just come through and you can see them over here in the vagina. The patient come with a lot of the bleeding and in the emergency, and we can see when we see them with the help of certain instruments, a big ball-like structure is coming out through the vagina. And there are different types of them. They can either be just protruding into the cavity of the uterus, or they can be just under the lining of the uterus, or they can be in the wall of the uterus, or they can be just as a stock and pedunculated and moving over here. So sometimes it detaches from here and it goes into the tummy. As a result of which the people come with the vomiting, with the severe pain. However, please don't be afraid. This thing is very, very rare. In my 30 years of the career, I have just seen two people like that, that the, uh, the stock or this, this thing, it detaches and then it goes into the tummy. Most of the time they are like this or they are like this, or they are in the wall. These are the usual type of the presentations about the fibroids. So fibroids are known cancerous growth, which develop in the uterus. So as you can see, it happens in the uterus. The uterus is, is this part. They are also known as uterine fibroids or leomyomas. Fibroids can vary in their size and their number, and they are common health issue among the women. And as I said in the introduction, so what are the different types of the fibroids? Intramural fibroids. Intramural means they are in the muscles, in the wall of the uterus, because uterus has got a three layers. This is inside the lining, the pinkish one, and this one, the thicker one, these are actually the muscle of the uterus itself, and the outside lining is the serosa or the outer side of the uterus. So the one which develops in the wall, they are called as intramural fibroids. Some mucosal fibroids which develop under the this lining of the uterus. This is called as a submucosal fibroid. Sometimes they get ulceration and they can even detach or they can just form like the polyp sort of the thing over here. Then there are subserosal fibroids. Subserosal fibroids, they are more towards the outer side, like this, or they can be like this. They, they are attached with the stock, or they can be just towards the outer side of the uterus. So I hope so, uh, this part has been cleared. So if you see anyone who has the fibroid, they see on their ultrasound intramural, subserosal, and uh, the pedunculated and uh, the submucosal. So this is none for you. This is actually for the healthcare professionals to make the plan. And then what are the causes of the fibroid? This is the question. This was the most uh, uh, searched of question in the search engine that what is the cause of the fibroid? In the real sense, there is no cause of the fibroids. It can come to anybody at any time. This is just a swelling of the uterus. This is like that in the real sense. However, in the studies and in the research, we have seen that there are certain hormones which can cause the uh, fibroids to come, specifically the estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen and progesterone, these are the two female hormones which come in the periods. And these are the two hormones which actually bring the period. So any condition which can cause increase in these uh, two hormones, they can bring the fibroids. Then the genetic predisposition, that if the woman's uh, sister or the mother, she has a fibroid, there can be a chance that the woman may have the fibroid or the sisters can have the fibroid. And it has also been seen in certain uh, ethnicities or certain, certain races. For example, the black woman or African woman and the American black woman, they are the one who are more predisposed to it. So these, you know, in the science and in the research, we always see that what are the different things what are the different women who are developing it? So these are all the genetic predispositions which have, have been seen. But in the real sense, I tell you, there is no cause for it. And then the obesity in the diet, who, which is rich in the red meat. 
they increase the risk of the fibroid. Why? Because all of them, they are associated with the high level of the estrogen. Because once there is obesity or the weight gain in the cells of the fat, there is more amount of the estrogen. And as you know, estrogen, as I told, is actually the food of these fibroids. Hence, if somebody is having the fibroid and she gets pregnant on top of it, then if the fibroid is four centimeter, maybe it will become 10 centimeter, 12 centimeter. So we see a lot of the people who are coming with the fibroids in the pregnancy. And then they are worried, oh, the blood will go to the um, uh, fibroid, not to the baby. Yes, it happens. But it depends upon, again, the position of the fibroid. If the, pos if the position is outside, outside wall of the uterus, that nothing happens to the baby. However, there will be a fact on the root of the birth, whether she will end up in cesarean or she will end up in the normal vaginal births. So, you know, the fibroids are not alone coming to the younger people. They can also happen during the pregnancy. So the things are different and we see different people and the different things. So what are the symptoms? Usually the fibroids, they come with heavy bleeding. The people, they always come and they say, we have heavy bleeding, we are passing the clots. And or sometimes they say that we have irregular bleeding. And for example, they have two, three times period in a month. It is not monthly bleeding. It is a irregular bleeding. They can come at any time. Or they come with the vaginal discharge. Because if the fibroid, if it is coming through the neck of the uterus into the vagina, so it can come with the bleeding and with the vaginal discharge, which is a foul smelling. Sometimes they also come with the pelvic pain and they say we are unable to pass the urine. And these are the pressure effects because the uterus is in the middle and in the, in the French part is the bladder, uh, which brings the urine out. So there is an irritation between the uterus and the bladder. And hence, the, sometimes there is a retention of the urine and the people are not able to pass the urine. So that's why the people come with the pressure symptoms. And sometimes there can be a frequent urination, increase uh, frequency of the urine. You, they keep on going to the washroom and then there is a difficulty in emptying the bladder and there can be the urinary retention that they're not able to pass the urine. Or sometimes they uh, give a lot of the pressure on the uh, tubes of the bladder that the fact can be on the kidneys as well. In the last year, we removed a huge fibroid, which was about a 17 kg in its weight. And it was in Saudi Arabia when I was working in Saudi Arabia. Then I removed a huge fibroid and this news was published in the newspaper. This was a big, big fibroid. It was in a 50 years old woman and she did not have any child. So the woman kept on uh, having increase in the size of the fibroid because she was afraid if I will go, they will remove my uterus. This is not always the case. Sometimes we just remove the fibroid. Yes, there are the few cases if the fibroid is to such an extent that we cannot remove it alone, we have to remove the uterus. That is something different. She was uh, 51 years at uh, that point when she came to me and it was a heavy bleeding with a big tummy and the fibroid was reaching up and filling the whole tummy. And the operation was really, really difficult. We went through two hours and uh, then we removed it. So, and the patient was very happy afterwards. So this was a huge tumor. This is how the people keep on developing them and they are afraid they don't come to the doctors. How you diagnose it? The diagnosis is by the examination of the patient as such by the doctor. She can see your tummy or in the married woman, they can do the vaginal examination to see where exactly the fibroid is, what is the location and what is the size. And then we do the ultrasound. Ultrasound is the first thing which we do in the clinic. And on that, we can even show the images to the woman that this is the fibroid and this is the size. Then uh, nowadays, we are also having MRI scan, which is a very advanced sort of the thing. And hence, we switch on to the MRI or the CT scans for detailed visualization before we go ahead for the operation, as I did the MRI scan of my patient, as I discussed before, I wanted to see that what exactly the structures it is involving. Maybe it is involving the intestines, maybe it is involving the ureters, which are the tubes bringing the urine. So we have to be very careful before planning the uh, treatment options to the woman. So what are the treatment options? Either you don't do anything. For example, if the fibroid is three centimeter, two centimeter, or less than five centimeters, don't do anything. 
just tell the woman, yes, you have the fibroid and there is no symptoms. She's having normal periods, no pain, nothing. Only the ultrasound was done for some other reason. For example, for her tummy, for her intestine. And then the ultrasonologist or the doctor, uh, they find that there is a fibroid and they will tell the woman that, oh, you have a fibroid. So then she start worrying about it. Oh, I have the tumor. So in those cases where there is no symptom of the patient, fibroid is small, don't do anything. However, just tell the woman properly, yes, you have the fibroid, but this is not cancer, number one. Number two, you don't have the symptoms. And number three, there is no hurry in treating them. However, we can do your ultrasound after six months if you are worried about it. Or the second option is till you get some symptoms or you have pain or anything, these are the symptoms which can develop, then you can come back. But uh, what I do practically for their satisfaction and for my satisfaction, I repeat the scan after six months. And then I give the uh, option to come and discuss the further things. So this is another way. Sometimes I supplement my information with the patient information leaflets, and then they can read through it that this is a sort of the answer question uh, which are printed out and then uh, they can read through it. And I give them the time to just think about it, write your question, come back to the clinic and we can discuss it. This is what I also do in the online consultations as well. I always tell the patient that the, this is the thing which you have. Yes, you have this thing. And this is the information, just go through it and then we can discuss it in our next session. So this is more good for the patients because this is not Anita, just to give your the management, okay, you go home and uh, that's it. No, we have to uh, discuss with the patient what exactly she's having and what are her options and what she can do and what she's expecting. This is one, that watchful uh, treatment options. But for asymptomatic fibroids, you should see that I have written asymptomatic. Second part is medications to control the symptoms like the pain and the bleeding. There are the different options in it. We sometimes give them uh, different medications, tranexamic acid, or sometimes a methanamic acid, and sometimes oral contraceptive pills, or sometimes other more uh, hormones, which are important to reduce the amount of the estrogen in the body so that the growth reduces. And then there is a surgical intervention. For example, the myomectomy, the removal of the fibroid only, or the hysterectomy. So these two options are different myomectomy for the younger age group and the one who want to preserve their uterus because for example if the woman she has one baby or she has two children and she wants to bring more children so in those cases i just give them the option that you can have just a myomectomy remove the fibroid and leave the uterus so this is one way but if the woman she is 55 and she is coming with the fibroid so i will remove her uterus even then i give her the option you want to keep the uterus or you want to remove the uterus? And this is up to her. And if still she she will ask me, what do you recommend? I will tell her that, see, the fibroids can come back to you. There are the lesser chances, although, but yes, it can come back. So the decision is yours. You have completed your family. And if you will keep the uterus, you will cut the menopause. So the for me, the better option is to go for hysterectomy. She says, no, I don't want to remove the uterus because I no more feel as a, as a female. So that's okay, no problem. You can just remove the fibroids even in those cases and retain the uterus with her. So you have to go with the patient's will and wish till it is safe. However, if my patient, she's a cancer patient and I have to remove her uterus, I will tell her, no, we cannot keep your uterus. We have to remove it. Your life is more important as compared to the uterus. So, you know, you have to talk to the patient properly and tell her her options. In the lifestyle modification is important because I told you that estrogen is actually the food for them. So maintaining the healthy lifestyle, reducing the weight, eating balanced diet, which is rich in the fruits, vegetables, and the whole grains, regular exercise. They can help manage the symptoms and reduce the risk of the fibroids. So this is again the backbone. What are the complications? The complications are anemia, which is a lack of blood. This is why, because she is losing a lot of the blood. As I said, they can be asymptomatic or they can produce the symptoms. The symptoms are heavy bleeding. If she will produce or she will have a lot of the heavy bleeding, her hemoglobin will go down and hence she will develop the anemia. So she can develop anemia. Secondly, if these fibroids, they are in the cavity of the uterus. So the uterus will not keep the 
baby over here, either there will be abortion or there will be difficulty in getting pregnancy. So in those cases, we have to remove it. Or for example, previously the patient produces a child before time, which is a preterm birth, like six months because of a bigish fibroid. So we have to remove it before attempting her uh, future pregnancy. So these are the things. Rarely the severe pain or sudden sharp pain. Specifically, this happens during the pregnancy because in pregnancy, we have a lot, lot of the estrogen coming in the body from the placenta or which is called as afterbirth through which the baby is getting the food. So because of that, there is a lot of the big size of the fibroid. It grows like anything. And as a result of which, there is a lot of the pain. So if it happens, then what we need to do, we have to admit the patient in the hospital. We have to give her the painkillers and we will see her response. And most of the time, 99% of the time, it just goes away with giving the IV fluids as well as the analgesia. There is no hurry in removing the fibroids during the pregnancy. Very, very rarely we remove the fibroid if it is really, really indicated. Otherwise, we don't remove the fibroid as an emergency situation, right? Specifically during the pregnancy. So we just admit the patient, we give her painkillers and hydration, and we just support her and tell her that it will go with the time. And most of the time, the people understand and only think she needs psychological support and the talk from her doctor. This is the main thing. If you do not talk to the patient, they are always in the midway and they don't know what is going on, what is happening, what will happen with her, with her baby. So we have to address their concerns and questions. How you can prevent it? This is also another question. How can you prevent them? As I said, uh, having a healthy lifestyle, which is a low sugar diet, they can reduce the risk of uterine fibroids, food which is rich in beta carotene, like the folates, fibers, vitamin C, E, and K, diet like the broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower can help reduce the risk of uterine fibroids, regular exercise, stress-free lifestyle. They reduce the uterine fibroids in the incidence how the stress is related. Stress is actually associated with the release of the hormones and these hormones can give rise to imbalance in the hormones as a result of which the fibroids can come. Or you can also go to your doctor for the regular gynecological checkup. They can help with the early detection and the management of the fibroids accordingly. Yes, you can, you can do much better if you have the fibroids. Don't be afraid of the fibroids. Just talk to your doctor and we can help you there and then. So in conclusion, I would say that fibroid uterus is a common condition which can affect many women during their reproductive years. But the important thing is awareness, early diagnosis, and appropriate management plan to improve the quality of the life. And consult a healthcare provider to provide you a personalized care plan and the options which are for you. So you can always uh, combat with them and you can always overcome with them. This is not a big deal. Yes, you can do that because many people, they can uh, do it if uh, they just go with our advice. So this is how we want you to look like. So now uh, we will switch over to our uh, next slides and uh, please just put on your questions in the chat box. And uh, my dear friend Isa is taking all the questions. And now I'm switching over to the dysmenorrhea or the painful periods. Thank you so much to all the attendees who are still here and who are still joining. Um, would you guys please stay for a couple more minutes? We just have two topics to go through and then we will take on your questions A ASAP, inshallah. Dr. Saba, please continue. Yeah, uh, we can continue. We can answer their question, what they want. Okay, I'm going to uh, ask you questions specifically from PCOS and uterine fibroids. Okay. okay, the mm. first couple of questions are by Dr. Karen. She's asking, is there a relationship between PCOS and iron deficiency? And she's also asking about PCOS that in your experience, Dr. Yasmin, how long does it take to recover? And is there a recurrence of PCOS later down the life? Uh, 
this is a very good question, Karen. Thank you for asking this question. So there are two parts of it. Number one, that we I will start with the second question first. Then she can understand the uh, first part. Uh, regarding the PCOS, PCOS is actually a condition which happens because of the increase in the estrogen in the body. Why? Because once the egg is formed in the first 14 days, the follicles, they grow. And on the 14th day, the estrogen becomes down and then the progesterone comes in the way because the eggs come and hence now that this is the time for the progesterone to come. So these two hormones, they keep on playing with each other. First half estrogen, second half progesterone after the release of the egg. But in PCOS patient, the real problem is with the ovulation. There is no more eggs. If the egg is not forming, only the estrogen will keep on coming. As I told you in our slides, you might have seen there are a lot of the follicles. There is no egg. If there is no egg on the top of it, there is a lot of the hormones which are coming. This is called as an estrogen. And along with the estrogen, androgen or the testosterone, which is a male hormone, it is also coming in the circulation. And hence, this is also converting into the estrogen. For example, let's see, we want estrogen 20 microgram. But over here, the estrogen, estrogen is going to be 80 microgram. So what will happen to the body? This estrogen, what it will do, it will keep on building the lining of the uterus. There will be no period. Period comes once there is ovulation. So the uterine lining, which should be like 1.1, 1.2 centimeter, it becomes 2 centimeter, 3 centimeter like that. It does not come off because every month the lining comes off. But in these PCO patients, the lining is not coming. It keeps on building. As a result of which, once there is by chance or by the medications which we give to the patient to bring the period, this lining comes out. Once this lining comes out, now the lining is very thick. What happens? The period is very heavy, number one. Number two, uh, it keeps on linger on. For example, the normal people, they bleed like five to six days. These people, they bleed 15 days, 20 days, or they stop for five days. Then again, they bleed because the lining of the uterus has to come through all of it till it, is, it finishes out. So this is the thing which is bringing the deficiency of the blood and the iron deficiency anemia. Yes, there is a correlation between these two. However, iron deficiency itself does not bring the PCOS. PCOS can bring the iron deficiency anemia. It is because of the loss of the blood and loss of the endometrium, which is going on for a longer period of the time. I hope so. The question uh, is clear now. Okay. And what about reoccurrence or uh, yeah. are there any patients who recover from it completely and who recover from it forever? Yeah. Very important thing. If you go on with the lifestyle modification, uh, reduce your weight, okay, healthy lifestyle, and your nutrition, eat green, huh? All of these things they help you in preventing and recovering from the PCOS completely. Yes, I have seen the people who recovered completely. They get pregnant, and it usually does not come back. It comes back once you start increasing your lifestyle problems. Then it can come back. However, there is very less chance. If you control it, it goes away. And one more important thing, it's a it's little bit long term journey. It's not like you just uh, will have it within a week or so. You know, it takes time because the weight gain which happened is really a re little bit resistant. The people who are suffering with the PCOS, they know that how difficult it is to reduce the weight because this is induced by the androgens or the male hormone, which is very difficult to get rid of. However, with the medications, with the diet and exercise and stress-free, all of these things, they can help you. And along with you, if, for example, the periods are irregular, you are using the oral contraceptive pill. Yes, you can get rid of them within six months to one year. This is my clinical experience. So that's why when the people come to me in the clinic, I always tell them, see, this condition, PCO, is not a cancer. Okay, so don't be afraid of it. Number one lesson for you. But this is curable. This is a good thing for you because in younger age group, even the cancers can happen. So you are lucky. You don't have this. You have only PCU, PCOS, which is a curable disease. And then we have to work as a team because the doctor, the patient, the family, they are a team. And if you will work as a team, I hope so you will get rid of this PCO. And in the longer term, 
as i told you it is curable number one how much time patients are different but my experience is six months to one year and thirdly it does not come back until or unless you again switch over to the hormonal imbalance then it can come back great now i have two questions about uterine fibroids one is once again by dr karen she's asking uh, can fab, fab, uh, fibroids be removed with laser treatment and if yes is it safe yeah uh, yes karen uh, actually she's a doctor and she's asking me from that point of view as well so yeah. karen i will i will let you know that the fibroids are removable with lot of the options as we are doing a public webinar so i did not touch those actually recently uh, for the last uh, four or five years we have started doing the uterine artery embolization what is this new technology uterine artery embolization is a technique in which we go through some uh, uh, blood vessels in the legs and then we target the uterine vessel in the uh, fibroid and then we pass through certain chemicals through them what happens it causes the shrinkage of the blood vessels and there is no more supply of the blood to the fibroids but please remember for all the general public as well this treatment option is not for everyone because this treatment option just came about a 4 5 years ago and yes it can be but for those people who have completed their families number 1 those people who accept it and they come for the follow up and number 3 they accept that there is a chance that they have to undergo the operation and number 4 it can give rise to problem with the production of the eggs because still we are not sure whether it is safe for the ovaries or not because sometimes when you inject the particles through the laser sometimes they can these particles they can go into the blood vessels of the ovary so in the younger people who are going to produce their children so maybe they will suffer with the less number of the eggs so yes there is availability we can do that but with the certain patients not for everyone right okay great uh, fatma khaled i hope your answer has been answered as well your question has been an- answered as well she actually asked for embolization a uh, procedure that dr yasmin already has answered uh, the next question is by busha salim and she is asking what are the some common causes of missed or delayed periods how do factors like stress diet exercise hormonal imbalances play a role if it's regular to missed the periods every month for like 7 days or 10 days regular missing of period every month basically that is what she is asking about yeah uh, this question will be covered in the next uh, lecture irregular periods however we have covered in the pcos as well yeah. the question is uh, actually missing the period 7 to 10 days is not normal okay actually the normal period should come after 22 days remember one thing and less than 35 days anything in between from 22 to 35 days is normal this is the normal duration of the cycle some people can have 28 days some will have 27 days some will have 26 days some will have 32 days some will have 30 days so the woman is different her her uh, her hypothalamus or the brain is different so this is the thing she has to regulate irregular period does not mean that you just have the irregularity and missing the period sometimes irregularity is even continuous bleeding irregularity is having lots of the bleeding so these all come in those factors your question that whether it is normal to uh, have the uh, missing regularly missing no this is not normal you have to look into it what is the reason and pcos i told you is one of the cause and the second question is that how the stress and the hormones and the exercise all of them are related as i told you that the stress releases the cortisol and adrenaline all of these factors they ultimately affect the fat and there is an increase in the fat content of the body and this fat it stores the estrogen the women who are having the stressful life or they are having uh, the weight gain uh, they are not doing the regular exercise they are eating lot of the meat and uh, specifically in these days when do, we are not having organic chicken so all of these factors and our sedentary lifestyle they are playing a role so we are getting uh, you know weight gain as a result of which we are getting all these things so if you regularly exercise and take care of your diet eat green vegetables 
and uh, uh, inositol containing contents. So then you can reverse all of these factors. So this is actually the underlying issue. Great, Dr. Chaba, we can move on now. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on, move on to over uh, the slides. Yes, Isa, can you see now? Yes, I can. So our third uh, lecture is about the painful periods. Uh, this is a condition which uh, our very young girls, they are suffering a lot. In the medical terminology, this is called as a dysmenorrhea. Uh, however, this is called as a painful periods. Having a period and then on the top of it, the painful is really something which the people are suffering and the girls sometimes they are younger and they are hiding. And uh, even sometimes I have seen in, in the communities, it is considered as a dilemma that the people don't tell even to their mothers. And hence they keep on suffering. So what is a painful period or a dysmenorrhea? First, we have to understand what is a painful period. Painful period is also known as a dysmenorrhea. It is a common among the women of childbearing age. The good thing about the painful period is it happens only in those women who have the ovulation or they are producing the eggs. These are the ones. However, this does not always is the case. Sometimes they are having certain problems like the endometriosis and adenomyosis or the infections of the genital tract, as a result of which they get the dysmenorrhea. So the condition uh, is sometimes there is nothing. This is just the hormonal problem. Or sometimes there can be underlying some pathology or some problem, as a result of which the people can have the dysmenorrhea. What are these and uh, how we treat with them? We will just see in a moment. There may be the different symptoms. These symptoms, they include the cramping, lower back pain, headache, nausea and the fatigue. And I think the people who are with us, uh, many of them might have experienced the dysmenorrhea. Actually, mild pain is quite normal. Having a back pain just before the onset of the period, maybe two, three, two, two, three days or even sometimes uh, four or five days or during the period is quite normal. But however, if it is really severe, which is affecting her quality of the life, the word is the quality of the life. That is, she is not able to do her day-to-day -day work. This is called as a quality of the life. So this thing which is affecting her quality of the life is the one which we have to address. And you can see all of these symptoms. I just put this picture just to give an idea that there can be nausea, there can be loose stool, there can be headache, back pain, hip pain, or the dizziness. These are all the things which can happen to the young girls. There are two types of it. One is the primary dysmenorrhea and another one is a secondary dysmenorrhea. Primary means there is nothing, no underlying problem. And uh, this is usually a menstrual pain without any underlying gynecological condition. She does not have anything in her ovaries. She does not have anything in her uterus. She herself does not have any problem. And this is just the hormones which are causing it. What is the cause of the primary dysmenorrhea? The scientists are struggling hard to find it. Sometimes they're saying this is hormonal problem. Sometimes they are saying that there is a release of the prostaglandin in the uterus. And now the theory is that sometimes they're saying there are the nerve fibers in the uterine cavity and hence they are more sensitive. And sometimes the people are also talking about that the woman who is more uh, high level of the IQs and who are having, uh, you know, the, uh, the she's very sensitive to the different things. Her pain threshold is low, they are suffering. However, the dysmenorrhea is always a suffering. It is really, really something which affects her. And sometimes I have seen the young girls not going to the school, the women not coming to the uh, their workplaces, and they're not even, even able to do their day-to-day uh, -day activities. The symptoms usually start just before or at the onset of the menstruation. As I said that, and the people who are experiencing it, they can understand very well what I mean. And then there is a secondary dysmenorrhea. Secondary dysmenorrhea is caused by some underlying condition, such as endometriosis, adenomyosis, or the fibroids. Endometriosis is actually a, a tissue or the thing which is like the lining of the uterus, but it is not inside the uterus. It is present outside the uterus, maybe in the ovary, maybe in the intestine, maybe in the ureter, anywhere in the tummy. This is called endometriosis. Adenomyosis is a uterine lining which is present in the wall of the uterus. 
these two are different and their symptoms is little bit mimicking with each other. However, their presentation is different. And as I said before, that the fibroids, they can also give rise, uh, give rise to the uh, secondary dysmenorrhea. So it often presents later in life and is associated with abnormal bleeding of the pelvic pain, this part, the secondary dysmenorrhea. Primary usually happens in the younger age group. There is nothing. However, the secondary dysmenorrhea usually happens later in life, like after 25 years of the age group, we usually see the secondary dysmenorrhea where the endometriosis and adenomyosis and the fibroids or the infections, they are more common. Diagnosis and the treatment of the underlying conditions are very crucial for managing the secondary dysmenorrhea. So that's why the woman who comes to us or a girl who comes to us for dysmenorrhea, what we need to do, we have to do one ultrasound to be on the safer side because sometimes this dysmenorrhea can be because of the fibroid in these patients or sometimes they are carrying the endometriotic or chocolate cyst in their ovaries, even in the younger age group. You know, there are always the variations. Even sometimes the things can happen in the very younger age group. So that's why we have to be very careful what we are dealing with. So uh, doing the an ultrasound is, uh, is uh, something which is very important in order to just be peaceful that your patient is safe. She is only the primary dysmenorrhea. So lifestyle management is important. We are the exercise, healthy diet, and managing the stress can help alleviate the menstrual pain. So this is actually uh, the thing which is important. Then applying heat to the abdomen or taking over-the-counter medications uh, like the ibuprofen, methinamic acid, they can also provide a good pain relief. Getting enough rest and starting staying hydrated are also important for managing the painful periods. So alternative therapies, what you can do, you can do a relief of the pain through acupuncture, yoga, or massage therapy, herbal medications like the ginger, chamomile, or the raspberry leaf tea may also help reduce the menstrual pain. And it is important to consult with the healthcare professional before trying any alternative therapies. These are all the alternative therapies. In our medicine, we have two types of the therapies, the primary therapies and the alternative therapies. Alternative therapies are those which do not have any scientific evidence that they play a role. But however, in the research and in the observation, it has been seen that they help in relieving the symptoms of the patient. So again, uh, the, uh, the topics which have been included today, so all of them, they are related with the estrogen levels to be higher up and all of them, they can be reversed back by reversing back the estrogen levels. So this is important. And because the endometriosis, adenomyosis, and the fibroids, they're all estrogen-dependent uh, conditions. So these are the things. However, in the practical uh, point of view, I have seen that uh, turmeric, this is very important. If you take turmeric in the hot milk, this is also very relieving and very soothing effect during the primary dysmenorrhea, even sometimes the secondary dysmenorrhea. So the menstrual cramp pains, initial steps are lifestyle adjustment, which include wholesome diet, regular exercise, healthy habits. This is the one. And then the second level of the treatment is the pharmacological options and also the alternative medications. The alternative medications, as I said, with the ginger, with the, uh, with the lifestyle modifications, as well as with the turmeric, these are the things. Or the chamomile, a raspberry tea, these are the ones. However, in the real sense, what the, what the doctors give to these patients? Initially, we give them with the painkiller, which is mephinamic acid or the postone, or we can give them the brufen, or we can give a little bit more higher level of the medication. Sometimes these women and these girls, they come to the hospital in an emergency with such a, a sort of the severe crampy pain where we have to give them the IV painkillers in the different forms of the treatment options, chamomile or sometimes we give them perfilgan, or sometimes we give them paracetamol, IV. These are all the options which we uh, give them. And uh, then uh, we have to uh, give them in very severe dysmenorrhea, oral contraceptive pills. Oral contraceptive pills, the action is they just reduce the ovulation and uh, hence there is no more estrogen and progesterone. <clears throat> As a result of which, the pain is uh, no more there. So this is one of the options. But again, 
you have to discuss the risks and the benefits. Sometimes the people, they are also in the need of the oral contraceptive pills. They are uh, in the way that they want the contraception and they want the relief of their uh, pain relief and the dysmenorrhea. So there, the oral contraceptive pill, they do marvelous. However, the people who are uh, in, in a very young age group and they are worried, they don't want to use oral contraceptive pill, as I said that. So it, there, we just have to go with the painkillers. But in very, very severe cases, we have to give them. Or sometimes even the higher level of the medications, which are GNRS analogs. So uh, those are the things which, which the things to be discussed with the doctor. So your doctor is the best one to give you a, a treatment option. So these, these are actually the uh, treatment options which usually we give to the patients, but it should be prescribed by your doctor. So hormonal birth control methods like the pill, the patch, they can help regulate the menstrual cycle and reduce the pain. They work by decreasing the amount of the prostaglandins which are produced and leading to the lighter period and less pain. So people who are using the contraceptive pill, please just uh, uh, clear it in your mind. You will not get a very heavy period. Be this is because of the contraceptive pill. Sometimes they come to the clinic and they say, doctor, I'm having a period only for one day. And this is very light. I just use one pad a day. And then it stops. When I ask them about the history, how many children you have? Are you using any contraceptive method? And she said, yes, I'm using yes mean. I'm using Ganera, I'm using Famila, I'm using this and that, whatever. Then she just need the support and the counseling that this is the effect of this contraceptive pill. That's why you are having the lesser amount of your period. So having the less amount on the contraceptive pill is not a big deal. This is normal thing and you should expect it. And this is a good thing. Having a period that I got one uh, question as well. I'm having a period only for two days, three days. It's good. It's not that the flow should be like anything and it is cleaning your uterus. No. If the period comes every month, even one day, even two days, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's not something cleaning from inside. No. This is something which is a cycle going on. As you eat, your stomach is working. As uh, you breathing, your uh, lungs are working. As your heart is working. So similarly, your uterus is working. So the people who are like they want to have the period for eight days with the flow, which is very good. So this is nothing like that. You just have to have the period for two days, one day, three days, having a lesser period, but regular. This is a good thing for you. You are not losing your blood. Not losing your blood is a good thing for you. You are not losing your iron, right? So please make it clear in it because when I uh, saw the questions in the in our uh, uh, forms, we saw this question as well. So this is the thing. So don't worry if the period comes for two days or three days, it's quite normal. Then discussing the options with the healthcare provider can help determine what is the best choice for you. So the question, when you should seek medical help, is every time the mild menstrual pain, which is the one you should go to the doctor or which is something uh, very severe one when you should seek medical help. This is up to you. I always tell my patient, whenever you think, even the mild thing is not uh, just uh, tolerable or it is giving you stress, just come to your doctor. There is no harm having one visit with her. Tell her your worries and tell her what you are having. And just do a scan and be careful. I was uh, telling that uh, at any point, anything which is concerning you, come to your doctor. Don't think that you have to wait for something that, uh, okay, this is very severe and then now you have to go. No, you can go at any point. However, what uh, we need exactly is if you think that the period pain is not under your control, it is really concerning you, come to your doctor because sometimes we see the chocolate cyst in these women or we see the fibroids in these women. Once we do the ultrasound, we are comfortable. My patient is not having a big deal. She is just having a primary dysmenorrhea and I can manage it with the simple remedies. So this gives uh, comfort to me and comfort to my patient. And that's all. This is what we want. However, if she is getting something, we can always go ahead and treat that condition rather than keep on suffering at home. As I told you, 
that we had one patient who came with a very huge tumor filling up a whole of her tummy. And when she came, uh, it was really difficult for us to resect the tumor. So the, uh, at any point, where do you think the things are out of control? They are giving you, uh, they're giving you a trouble uh, and you are concerned about it, come to your doctor. If the menstrual pain is suddenly becoming very severe, it is accompanied by other concerning symptoms, you have to see your doctor. Persistent debilitating pain during the periods may indicate an underlying condition which requires a medical attention. Regular gynecological checkups are more important for early detection and the management of any menstrual disorder. Because sometimes, as I said, the fibroids in the neck of the uterus or the cervix, the people, they just keep on sitting at home and the fibroid becomes so big that it just spreads on the lateral side, on the, on, on the sides of the uterus, and then it involves the ureters as well. And then they come with the blockage of the ureters and sometimes even the people with the cancers they just keep on sitting at home and they don't come to the doctor when we see inside there is a big masses or the big cancer tissue which is protruding through the cervix so anything which is concerning you please come to your doctor and come forward and talk about it and this is an idea behind that i wanted uh, i started these webinars just to create awareness among the people i think we have done our uh, yeah uh, menstrual health. I want to highlight about the menstrual health as well. This is what? This is the empowerment through education. This is what we are doing today. Empowering you and empowering the woman through education is important about her menstrual health. Menstruation is not something which you should not talk about. Menstruation is something you always talk about rather than becoming late and, and getting the problems with you. Always come forward and talk to uh, talk to your doctor, talk to your mother, talk to your sister, talk to your friend, or come to the doctor. So this is actually the first lesson about the menstrual health. Educating oneself about the menstrual health and normalizing the conversations about the periods can help reduce stigmata and improve the awareness among the people. Understanding one's own body and the menstrual cycle can empower the individuals to better manage their menstrual cycle, menstrual health. Seeking help from your friends, from your mother or doctor is beneficial for managing the painful periods. Menses is not something uh, as it was in old era, uh, you should hide. No, you don't hide anything about it. This is something which is normal. This is normal. As your body, other parts of the body, they are working, your uterus is working, your ovaries are working. You have to talk about. Over here in the Gulf countries, we are getting the mothers uh, even before the onset of the period, they bring the child and uh, when she is 12 years or 13 years and she brings the child just to uh, have a menstrual education that what is it, how she should, what type of the she, uh, pads she must use. So cleanliness during the periods, using the proper pads, the proper sanitary pads, these are the ones changing on day to day basis and not just putting the same pad for a longer period of the time, having yourself washed down taking shower during the menstrual period, because I have seen uh, specifically in the underdeveloped countries, the mothers are telling, oh, don't take shower during the uh, menstrual cycle because uh, your blood will not come out. No, your uterus is an organ which is made by the God in such a way, it will bring everything out until or unless there is a blockage, then there is something else. But in the normal people, it will bring out everything. If you do not get the period in time, seek help, please and come to your doctor, talk about it. Now, supporting others, how it is. Friends, family members, partners, they can offer support and understanding to those who are experiencing the painful period. You know, sometimes the people come to my clinic and I just talk to them. I take a paper and I make a trunk for them or I have very nice pictures as well in my clinic, which I have uh, kept for my younger um, patients. I just tell them, see, this is the uterus, these are the ovaries, and uh, the hormones are coming from your brain at certain time. And these two hormones, estrogen and progesterone, they are responsible. And as a result of which, you are getting this uh, periods, and there is a little bit pain with the periods. And what are our options now? So just telling them and counseling them, they they are more comfortable and giving them the support in those people or if they carry something like the fibers or anything 
you can very gently discuss with them. Yes, we have the treatment options. You are not alone. There are lots of the people who are who are having it. And this is none of her fault that she is carrying the dysmenorrhea. She is carrying a fibroid. This is a woman body. Anybody can develop anything. So, but we have to be open for the communication about the menstrual health and seeking the uh, help and breaking the taboos and providing the comfort to the woman. Empathy, patience, and the practical assistance can go a long way in helping someone coping up with the painful period. This is what I want. If someone at your home, your, your, your sister or your friend or anyone who is having this trouble, just talk to her. Yes, this is the problem, but you can come over it. We have to go to the doctor. We have to do the scan. If everything is, uh, is good, so fine. We can just go ahead with it. So conclusion, painful periods are a common experience for many women, but they can be managed with the right strategies and the support. By understanding the cause of the menstrual pain, exploring the treatment options, and seeking the appropriate medical care, individuals can improve their quality of the life. Remember, it's important to prioritize self-care. Prioritize self-care. Self-care. Self-care means your own care. Not only the care of your um, loved ones. Yes, I know. You have to give care to your loved ones, your husband, your children and your mother and your father and your brothers and your sister but you should take care of yourself as well so you must have a time on the day on day-to-day -day basis where you should take care of yourself advocate for your health needs and reach out for help whenever it is needed so this is what we want from our patients we want to see you happy and healthy so this is the conclusion about our uh, fibroids and then now we will switch over to the over last one. And this is about over regular periods. Isa, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, fine. Can you see the slides now? Yes. So we are marvelous. We are with the our with our last slides. So Isa, we are okay. Yeah, we are good. We are good. Thank you, Isa, for your continuous support and help. You are so marvelous. Okay, so let's move on to the irregular periods, and we will also touch a few questions which we got uh, during our uh, during your registration uh, process. So what are the irregular periods? Irregular periods are the changes in the length, duration, or heaviness of the period. This is called as an irregular period. So the people who are thinking that irregular period means only the delayed period, no. It, is, it may be the long, it may be a lesser duration, it may be more duration, or they may be heavy. So all of them, they are called as an uh, are irregular period. It is common for the women to experience the irregular periods at some point in their life. Skipping or having two times a period in once in a year is something you should not be worried about. However, <clears throat> when it, it comes as a regular sort of the thing, then you have to be worried about. Understanding the cause and the potential implication is very important to know about the woman. So this, this uh, cycle or this circle I have made that to show you how the things happen so you can see that if you start from the if you just start from the first day of the menstrual cycle what happens during the fifth days uterine lining breaks down and the menstruation happen this is the menstrual period or menstruation or the menses which is happening during this five days right but at the same time even in this time the uterine lining starts growing again but more from the sixth or seventh day, when, when you just finish your period, again, the next cycle starts. Uterine lining thickens again, you know, till 10th day, then even till about 14th day. On the 14th day, the egg is relieved from the ovary. Egg is relieved, and hence now, this part is related with the estrogen. This part, whole part till 14th day is related with the estrogen. Progesterone is there, but very little quantity. Once the egg is released, now the progesterone is in the way. Once the progesterone is in the way, it also causes the uterine lining to become thickened out. And as a result of which, this thickening happens, and at about 26 
or 27th day, this progesterone starts becoming less. It drops down. And now the next period will start. So till 26, 27 days, both the estrogen and progesterone, they drop down, specifically over here, the progesterone. And hence, after the 28th day, this period again starts. And this circle, this circle is actually the cycle. It goes on in the woman's life. This is the normal thing. You can see that if you draw a line, this is the half part and this is the half part. This half part is the 14th day. This half part is the 14th day. This half part is from 1 to 14th and this is from 15 to 28. Actually, this is the normal thing. And you can see the changes which are happening in the uterus. These changes are under the effect of these ovaries. And these ovaries, they are controlled in the brain with the help of certain hormones which come from the master gland called hypothalamus. So this is the uh, this this is the main uh, things which are happening in the normal people. So causes of the irregular periods, as I said, PCOS. This is one of the most most important thing in these days we are facing. So these are the polycystic ovarian syndrome or the thyroid disorder, thyroid disorder or the thyroid problems either increase in their amount or decrease in their amount. This is a gland which is present in the neck which is also called as a goiter. So these are the things, two major things which can give rise to irregular periods. So the people who are coming to us with the irregular period, we also check for them about the thyroids. Sometimes we do the thyroid functions and we come to know that she is having hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. Hypo is less amount of the thyroxine in the body and uh, uh, hyper is more amount of the thyroxine in the body. Both of these conditions are different but they can give rise to irregular periods. Again, the stress, excessive exercise, yes. Now you will ask me, how excessive exercise? Excessive exercise can give rise to irregular periods because to bring the period, there is a certain amount of the BMI or the weight should be there to bring the period. So not only the heavy weight, but the underweight, they are also associated with the irregular periods. The very young uh, uh, girls who are underweight, they can also experience the irregular periods. They can skip the periods or they can have the continuous bleeding. So, so these two things are important. So doing the excessive exercise is also another thing because the brain, which is hypothalamus, it has to produce the hormones at certain level of the weight. If that certain level is not attained, then that woman may not have the irregular periods. And that level is at least the BMI should be 18. If the BMI is less, then again, there will be a trouble. So these people, when they go to the doctors, they usually prescribe them the hormones. Oh, do you take this medication for three days, five days, and then the period will come. And the, uh, and the mother is satisfied. Okay, high child is getting the period. There is nothing to do in these cases. Just ask her to have a healthy, regular diet and ask her if she is doing some excessive exercise. Because some people, they're very much worried about their weight, specifically the belly dancers. They are the one. We see them in them because they are trying to maintain their weight at any cost. Or there are the people uh, who want their figure to be perfect. So that's why they want to lose their weight. And in that way, they are doing some excessive exercise so that there is no more a good amount of the fat in their body and hence the hormonal imbalance happens. So two extremes of the weight, they are associated with the irregular bleeding or significant weight changes can disrupt the menstrual cycle. Certain medications, people are also taking certain med medicines which are associated to bring the irregular period. Some people, they're taking antipsychotic medications. Some people, they're taking some treatment for the breast cancer. Some people are taking the treatment for leukemias. So they all can affect the egg production and hence they can have the irregular periods. So irregular period is something which is not only because of PCOS or the thyroid disorder. It has many underlying conditions which can give rise to the irregular period. Now, about the irregular period, how you identify the irregular period? They are defined as any irregularity in the menstrual cycle. Menstrual cycle is actually the whole wheel which I told you before. This is called as a menstrual cycle, which relates to its length, flow, ovulation pattern or the symptoms 
which can accompany the monthly bleeding. How you identify? There are the different terminologies which we use. Amenorrhea means there is no period at all. This is also another condition where the people do not get the uh, periods. So the doctor has to see what is the cause. There are lots of the causes. Oligomenorrhea, infrequent period. That's the cycle is more than 35 days. Or polymenorrhea means, poly means more, where the frequent period comes. As I told you, the period should come after 22 days and less than 35 days. This is the actual duration. So if it comes very frequently, this is polymenorrhea. She's getting two times, three times in a month. Menorrhagia means heavy period. Hypomenorrhea means very light period. If they are not without any reason, then you have to look forward for it. Metrorrhagia, which means spotting, which can happen at any time. Dysmenorrhea is a painful and ovulation is absence of ovulation. And oligovulation means irregular, infrequent ovulation, which happens usually. I made this slide because now the people are reading about it. And when you just go through the Google, you will see amenorrhea, oligomenorrhea, polymenorrhea. I just put this slide. Although these are all the medical terminologies, but I put it just to highlight that what is the meaning of all of this. So when you are reading through the Google, please make sure that you are reading through the proper channel because Google is writing about, you know, all as a whole. So you are different. Your sister is different. Your mother is different. So the one thing which fits in one person may not be fit in the other person. So be careful about it. If you are reading anything, you have to discuss it with your doctor, not thinking that you are suffering with this condition and making yourself under pressure. What are the symptoms? Symptoms can include unpredictable cycle length. You don't know when the cycle will come. You don't know when the period will come. It can come after 15 days. It can come after two months. You don't know. Or you skip the periods or unusually heavy or light bleeding. Some women may experience symptoms like the cramping, mood changes, or the other physical discomfort during the irregular period. This is called as a premenstrual syndrome. We will also touch this topic in our coming webinars. But we will need your feedback. What exactly, how was this webinar? Number one, was it helpful? And also, we want you to give us your feedback and what important topics you want to discuss so that it will be helpful for us to make over lectures accordingly. And keeping the track of the menstrual cycle and any accompanying symptoms can help identify the pattern. So what I do for my patients, when they come to me, I tell them, okay, you have irregular periods. Sometimes they are very clear about it, what they're talking about. Sometimes they're not clear about it. So in those times, it is always good that you just ask them to maintain the menstrual diary and just write down when you get the period and just write down when you stop the period and then bring that diary to me. Nowadays, we have the apps as well. So they can do it through the apps as well. And then I see what is the irregularity and then we can explain what is uh, causing. The implication of the irregular periods. If the irregular periods are there, what can happen? This is can sometimes indicate irregular periods means that sometimes it is nothing. Or sometimes there is some underlying health condition which may require a medical attention. As I said, there can be thyroid, or as I said, there can be the polycystic ovaries. As I said, there can be some medication she is taking, or she is developing some cancers as well. Because of this, all her things they are upside down. As a result of which, uh, she is getting this irregular periods. Prolonged irregularity or the sudden changes in the menstrual pattern should be discussed with the healthcare provider. Addressing the root cause of the irregular periods can help prevent the potential complications and improve the overall well-being of the mother. So, uh, sorry, of well-being of a woman. So, how you diagnose it? And is it normal to have irregular period? As we get the question, Isa told me about this, that she's skipping the period. One of our, uh, our attendee over here, she said that she's skipping her period. Is it normal? No, this is not normal. So healthcare provider may produce, may conduct a physical examination. She may see your pulse, your chest, your tummy, or may doing the ultrasound. And then sometimes the blood test or other diagnostic procedures can be done to identify the hormonal imbalances or underlying conditions. Keeping detailed record of the menstrual cycles and symptoms can aid in the diagnostic procedures. Yes, sometimes I have seen in my clinical practice, 45 years of age group, 50 years of age group, even in the 50 years of age group, 
people are coming with the irregular period. She skipped her period. Then she has irregular bleeding, coming and going, coming and going. Sometimes these people, they're pregnant. They themselves don't know. So what the doctors are all very clever. What they do, we quickly do the pregnancy test. And we are asking them, are you thinking you are pregnant? She says, no, I am 45. I am 40. I am 50. How can I be pregnant? No. There is always a possibility. So we always exclude. And sometimes, you know, we get it. The pregnancy test is positive and she is undergoing abortion. So this is another thing. So what is the treatment options for the irregular periods? As I said in all our uh, presentations today, because all of them I included today was uh, related with the hormones. So that's why in a nutshell, all the irregular periods, polycystic ovaries, fibroids, they need the treatment to be starting with the lifestyle changes, modifications, exercises, and the good habits. Then there are two levels of the treatment. One is alternative medications. Another one is a pharmaceutical uh, 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 options. Alternative medications are in the form of vitamins, phytoestrogenics, and hormonal regulating supplements. These medications should be used in consultation with your doctor, not writing on the Google and then just uh, ordering and eating all of those. No, these are the medications still. This, these are not approved by the Food and Drug Association, but you can use under the supervision of a doctor for a certain period of the time. Yes, you can use them, but with the consultation of the doctor, because we still don't know in the longer term what are their effects. Then the pharmacological options are we can regulate your period with the help of the oral contraceptives, with the help of intrauterine devices or the implants. Marina is one of them. And then the HRT, which is linked with the serious side effects. Somebody ask about the HRT. I will just address that question here. What is an HRT? HRT is a hormone replacement therapy. As I said in the first slide, in the wheel, we have estrogen and progesterone. Sometime in the normal, in the normal thing, let's talk about the normal thing. The period start at the age of usually 12 to 14 years of the age group. And then after this, it goes on. And then it becomes irregular at about 45 years of age group. And most of the women, they stop their period at about 51, some at 52, some at 55. Sort of every woman is different. So this is called as a menopause. When you start, it is menarche. When you stop, this is menopause. But in between, there are certain people who stop their period beforehand. They are not going into the 40. They are not going into the 50. They are stopping their period at 30, 35. This is very rare group of the women. And what are the causes? There is a, a sudden failure of the ovaries uh, quickly. And there is no cause, number one. Number two, there are some of the underlying tumors which are causing it. And sometimes they are using the chemotherapy, radiotherapy for, uh, for some other reason. For example, she's carrying leukemia. She is carrying a uh, sort of uh, breast cancer. And she's getting the chemotherapy for that. Or sometimes without any reason, it stop itself. This is idiopathic. Idiopathic means there is no cause. And usually it happens in the woman in less than 40 years of the age group, where we call them as a premature ovarian failure. So the, this is the age group where we have to give them the hormone replacement therapy. Why? Because estrogen is very good for the bones, as well as for the heart health, as well as for the skin. You know, when the woman, she turns out to be 55 or 60, there is a wrinkle on the face, wrinkle on the, uh, on the hands. And then she comes old lady. Why? Because there is no more estrogen. Estrogen is a hormone which keeps you young. It keeps the collagen in your body. Once there is no estrogen, so there is no collagen. Hence, the skin becomes, you know, loose and wrinkled. This is one part. Secondly, it helps the heart in the proper proper condition. It is very good for the heart health of the woman. And also the bones are kept strong. However, in the younger age group, if she is having a failure of the ovaries, she is at the risk of all these problems. She will be an old lady in a very young age group because of the uh, loss of collagen. She's at the risk of heart problem. She's uh, at the risk of having the bone aches and pains. So in order to avoid that, we have to give the HRT. HRT is a condition, is a hormone, which is uh, prepared outside the body. These are not natural. They are prepared outside estrogen and progesterone. They have to be given to such women which are very young. 
in order to take care and respect their bones and heart and the skin. But this is not for everyone because HRT has got its own side effects. You have to see that my patient is fit for this HRT or no. Not all the women, they can use the HRT. And secondly, HRT is not recommended more than 55 years of the age group. If you use it, this is just for four, five years. And then you can take a break. And then again, you can discuss it with your doctor. However, after 55 years of the age group, using the HRT can have more side effects. And one of them is breast cancer. Second one of them is having the clots or the uh, problems in the in the chest or the problems in the legs, which is in the form of the formation of a clot. So HRT should be used with the proper advice from the doctor. So lifestyle tips for managing the irregular periods, maintaining a healthy diet, regular exercise, routine, and stress management practices can help regulate menstrual cycle, prioritize your care, adequate sleep, relaxation techniques may also support the hormonal balances and overall menstrual health. Consulting with the healthcare provider or a specialist can provide the personalized care and managing the problems. Impact of irregular periods. What impact it can have? It is because of the hormonal imbalance and hence the most important thing is the fertility, which can impact the ovulation and hence getting the pregnancy is difficult in such women. Seeking the medical advice for the irregular period is very important, especially for those women who are trying to conceive or they are concerned about their fertility. And then addressing the underlying cause for the irregular period. For example, if she is PCOS patient, we have to treat that. If she is thyroid patient, we have to treat that. If she is taking the chemotherapy, we have to tell her that this is the cause. And later on, once she is uh, completed, her period will revert back. Like you have to see that uh, what is your patient. Uh, every patient does not have the same cause. So importance of regular health checkups are also very important. And to go to the doctor and having the regular examination can help monitor the menstrual health and detect any irregularities earlier on. Open communication with the healthcare providers, having the, uh, having the discussion is very important and routine screening and evaluation. This is important. What is this routine screening and evaluation? This is specifically for the women once they are sexually active. We want to do the regular smears of the cervix. This is called as a pap smear. We will also include one time the pap smear. Pap smear is actually the early detection of the cervical cancer or the endometrial cancer because this is a small uh, sort of the screening test which we do in all the married uh, women and we tell them to come to the clinic after every three years if their smears are regular and they are okay. I, uh, when I worked in uh, uh, UK, we have seen over there, there is a full-fledged program for the cervical screening. And uh, cervical for the cervical screening, they send the invitation even to the woman after every three years. This is so nice over there. The woman comes and she has a cervical smear and then her result is posted to her. They are picking up the cervical, uh, the cervical cancers in a very quick way because sometimes the cervical cancer, it can present with the irregular periods. The woman comes and she says, I have uh, the bleeding for four or five days, then five, six days I have a spotting, then five, six days I don't have anything. So once she is saying that, I always start thinking that what is this woman and why she's having this I do the examination, not for the unmarried girls, for the married girls. And after this, I try to see their cervix. And if there is anything, we always tell them, you have to undergo the cervical screening, which is a pap smear. This is an era where the people are well educated. So when you tell them about the pap smear, they understand its importance. They do it. And once the report is there, it's ready in about a week time. Then we discuss that there is no uh, cancer cells. So it's okay. So we just go for the other causes of the irregular bleeding. And if there we find any cause, then we do that. If we don't find any cause, then we see what is the what is my patient? How is her weight? Is she stressful? Is she taking any medication? Then I address those things. So these, these are the very important things. So conclusion and the takeaway message today is 
irregular periods are a common concern for many women and they can have various causes and implications. Seeking the medical advice for irregular period is important to identify and address the underlying issues effectively. By understanding the factors contributing to the irregular periods and taking proactive steps to manage the menstrual health, individuals can promote uh, overall well-being and their fertility. So uh, with this, we end the irregular periods and uh, then now we are going Onto to the questions yeah q and a sessions and okay. uh, yeah uh, i just not we taking just have a, yeah we just have a couple of questions actually yes, most please. of them you already covered in your uh, slides thank you so much for that dr yasmin the session was really informative and really easy to understand one interesting question that Fatma Khalid has asked, it is about the seed cycling. You know, people eat pumpkin seeds. Do you understand seed cy cycling? It's in very yeah, trend, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah so yeah. Fatma Khalid is asking if there is any scientific evidence of that, especially in case of it helping with PCOS and fibroid shrinkage. Yeah. Uh, actually, seed cycling, you know, in our medicine, uh, we have a lot of the things. Uh, still in the medicine, many things are not cl uh, clarified scientifically. Many people, they are doing seed cycling. They're telling in the first 14 days, eat this. In the last 14 days, eat this. Pumpkin seed and flax seed and sort of these seeds. Uh, Fatima, regarding this seed uh, cycling, there is no uh, scientific evidence. There is no scientific evidence. However, these seeds, for example, the flax seeds, they are enriched in the estrogen and the phytoestrogens. So in the longer term, might be they, be they will be associated with some complications. So for me, I am a doctor. I don't recommend the things which is not evidence-based. I always practice because I am a Western qualified doctor from the England. So those people, they don't believe in all these things. So me also, I don't believe all this. And I always uh, don't uh, go something which is false with my patient. I don't give them the false hopes. I sit with them. I give them the time. I tell them, see, you have this. And then uh, the treatment options are this. And yes, many a times the people read about and they bring the questions and they're asking me, is there any role for this? Is there any role for that? I tell them, yes. There is no role of such things by the science, even, you know, the herbal medications that people are using. In the longer term, I have seen the people are getting, uh, God forbidden, the cancers and cancer etiology and the pathology. We still are not able to understand. There are the risk factors which we see in our day to day practice. But in the real sense, I tell you, we don't see what exactly is causing it. So for me, this is not evidence based and I don't recommend for my patients to go with it. I tell them to go with the one which is scientific one. I hope so. Uh, each answered your right. question. Yeah. There is one last question by Tehmina Jafri. She is asking a specific question. Um, her history is that her periods only happened for three days after the birth of her child. She only has one child. And is it normal because her pregnancy before uh, uh sorry her menstrual days before her preg preg pregnancy were of seven days and she's saying that you know her menstrual timeline has been reduced to three days instead of seven full days in a month yeah so uh Tehmina, uh for you although three days is normal okay the duration of the cycle from three to five days, even two to five days is normal. Please take it normal from two to seven days. Rather, it's normal. Getting the period every month. This is the very important thing. It comes in one day, two day, three day. It's OK. As I said before, it's not like it has to be like a flood and you just uh, have a lot of the uh, pads to be used. No, that is not a good thing for you. And secondly, from you, if you are breastfeeding, there are different scenarios in your case. After the birth of your baby, if you are breastfeeding in your body, when you breastfeed, prolactin is a hormone which comes during the breastfeeding. And this prolactin, it produces the less period. This is one. So might be that is the cause in your case. Secondly, might be you are using some sort of the contraceptive pill. 
as I told you in, in uh, our presentation, that contraceptive pill is also one of the cause that brings a lesser and lighter period and for lesser duration of time. And thirdly, might be there is a thyroid problem. So if you don't have any one of them, it is just by chance you are getting three days. It's quite normal. Don't worry about it. Okay. If you don't have any three of them, this is on its own coming for three days. So relax about it. There is nothing. Great, uh, Dr. Yasmin. I'm going to ask one last question. I'm sorry, we are taking a lot of your time here. No, 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 please carry on. But it's okay. It's just our last question and then we will wind up. Uh, mm -hmm. So, Dr. Karen is asking how significant is iron levels to a woman's reproductive health? Yeah, this is very important. The iron level in over women, this is really, really very important. This is actually the anemia. Anemia is actually the lesser amount of the iron. The causes of this iron, uh, low iron, is actually the heavy periods in the in the people who are having the menstruation, and the low iron in the reproductive age group is because of the lack of the diet to the woman during her pregnancy. Specifically, if she is belonging to the poor economic status, and secondly, she is producing a lot of the children. Once she produces a child, there should be at least a two years gap for her iron store to be replenished. If she is bringing a child every 10 months, every nine months, every one year, so there is no time for her iron store to uh, have the replenishment time. What are the implications? Implications are if the iron level is low, your hemoglobin will not be formed in a proper way. And once the hemoglobin is not there, you will end up in the weakness, difficulty in doing your household work and lethargy and dizziness and feeling weak so you see how it is implicating your uh, life so these are the implications which are happening and on the top of it with the low iron if she gets pregnant so her baby will be at the risk of having low nutrition and the baby cannot grow up to the proper mark and the baby weight will be lesser she will end up in the growth restriction and she herself will be in trouble and if for example this woman this is her fifth or sixth child she is at the risk of having the more bleeding during the delivery of the baby, which is called postpartum hemorrhage, which is one of the leading cause of maternal deaths. So if she loses too much blood and on the top of it, her hemoglobin is already six or seven. Hemoglobin actually in the pregnancy should be from 10 to 12. We accept 10, but ideally it should be 12. So if her hemoglobin is not 10, it is rather six. And now on the top of it, she comes to you in the advanced labor when she is near to deliver. She never attends your clinic. She is already iron deficiency anemia. She comes in an emergency and she is just delivering. She delivers. This is her fifth or sixth child. She ends up in the uh, more bleeding. So what will happen? The doctor will be in trouble. The patient will be in the trouble. This happens. And then you are giving her blood three, four uh, units at one time. And afterwards, you are diagnosing her as an iron deficiency anemia. And there is no, when you ask her, there is no time for her body to replenish her uh, iron stores and hence her last child born is one year and now she's bringing this one the other the second last is about two years like she's bringing a child every year so this is the way it can affect her not only the reproductive age group her quality of the life her work her health uh, happiness and also it is affecting her children health it is affecting her long-term health as well so it has a lot of the implications so we, we are planning to do one webinar about the pregnancy as well, uh, which will which you people who are not married, they can also attend. This will be a good opportunity for you people to attend and see how the pregnant women they are suffering. I'm trying to uh, make few lectures about it, specifically uh, the iron deficiency, anemias and nutrition in the diet, these things. And you can also go through our website where uh, we have posted a lot of the things about uh, different medical conditions like epilepsy, anemias, high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, and uh, so many other things. Headache in the pregnancy, migraine. Uh, you can see many posts on the Instagram as well. Vomiting in the pregnancy and uh, recurrent pregnancy losses, the abortions. And recently I have launched one uh, video about the recurrent pregnancy losses, twin pregnancy. Uh, I'm trying my day-to-day -day, uh, 
to do something and to share with the people to create awareness. I think Isa, we have posted all of them on our Instagram page as well as Facebook. Yes, we have. I will. I have also included our email address and our WhatsApp address. If any of you have any questions about anything that might come to your mind, any medical or clinical issues, or if you have any requests for any topics that should be covered in future web webinars, please contact us. Um, on the email and on the WhatsApp number or call number that have been given in the chat. I will also send all of you individually a thank you <clears throat> email with our uh, credentials as well so that you can easily contact us. OK, Dr. Yasmin has put it on the screen as well. So take a picture or take a screenshot, whatever is feasible. We would love your feedback and we would love any of your suggestions to make these webinars even better as an audience. If you have any um, pointers at all, please feel free to share with us. Um, thank you, Dr. Yasmin Naseeb. It was a very, very informative session, very easy to understand. And I'm sure everybody who has jo joined us, whether or not they are from a medical background, uh, they have taken some uh, uh, they have taken some good information from that. And uh, the basic thing, ladies, is to eat healthy, take a walk, uh, don't take a lot of stress, and take care of yourself first and foremost. This is what I have taken away from this web webinar, and I hope it helps you in your future as well. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, if there are not any questions, then you guys are free to leave if you want. Thank you so much. And uh, my hearty uh, gratitude and my thanks to all the attendees and uh, all the my IT team, specifically Izza, Shahriyar, everybody who made this webinar possible for me because my aim is to create, create awareness among the people as I have seen in my life, like how the woman is suffering at each and every step. So I have decided, actually I was, I was uh, trying to do this for a longer period of the time. And, uh, but because of my clinical commitments, family commitments, I could not do that. So then I discussed with my family and I'm so grateful to my family as well, specifically my two sons, Shafi and Walid, they made it possible, they pushed me hard. And they said, mommy, if this is your dedication, you want to do it, go ahead and do it. We will be with you. So uh, they created this team and uh, they made it possible. And I'm so grateful for all my IT support team that you made it possi possible for me and you made it very enjoyable even for me. You gave me an opportunity to talk to the woman directly. And I would say again, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for everybody who joined us. And I would love to have your feedback that how the session was, how the language was, was it simple? How were the slides? Was they easy? And what other important lectures or what other important information you people want? And I would say that in the end, that uh, the take home message is uh, regarding the menstruation, take it easy. Number one, this is something which is quite normal as your other parts of the body, they're working, your uterus is working, your ovaries are working, and you have to take the time for yourself. Self-care is very important for you. Don't think that this is a stigmata to have the PCO, to have the weight gain, to have uh, the problems with the hormone. Yes, we can work as a team and we can combat with it. And you can uh, just uh, overcome in all of these trouble because I have seen lots of the people who are committed. They are working with us and they are very cooperative patients and uh, they have get rid of all these problems. So I would say goodbye to everybody with so many hearty thanks to everyone who made this webinar successful. And we are here with you. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>